Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's do this big one last time. We've been hearing it for everybody that's been involved in this conference uh, throughout the day. So let's hear it for all the speakers, all the crew, the MC, everybody that's been responsible for putting this together. And yourselves. Yeah. I'd like you all to picture your perfect work environment, the environment that you've created for yourself that allows you to be productive and efficient in whatever it is that you're doing. Everyone have something in mind, right? Maybe it looks a little something like this, right? You got the noise-canceling headphones because of all those damn open office plans, right? You have a full cup of coffee, or I guess in your guys' case, it's like this, this big and full of <laughs> concentrated caffeine, right? But you have some good music on, you have your, your screen set up the way that you, you like it, and you're ready to rock and roll, right? Time to do some great design work, time to do some great dev work. Of course, this isn't how work happens, right? We're bothered by our colleagues, by our clients, right? We're interrupted constantly, right? We have so many things going on, so many people pestering us, and we are taken out of our little oasis uh, and have to sort of put out fires and do all these things, right? So, but this is the thing. Our work is done with other people, for other people, right? So this, this notion of, of sort of holding yourself up and going away and sort of working on your own genius uh, uh, creations is, is just far away from reality, right? So that means we have meetings. That means we have daily stand-ups. That means we have pair sessions. That means we have code reviews. That means we have post-mortems. That means we have to actually talk to people. That means endless Slack channels. Does anybody else feel this way about Slack? I'm like, oh my god, right? This is miserable, right? And this takes us away, and all we want to do is get back to our nice little oasis and do some work, right? But so this is a talk about how we work with each other, right? Because that matters, right? How do we talk to each other? How do we coordinate with other people? And how do we collaborate with each other? <laughs> Let's freak anybody out. Uh, this stuff is great. Give anybody anxiety here, right? We've sort of been talking about this over the last couple of days, right? And there's no shortage of, of these eternal battles on the web, right? So uh, let's hear it, uh, people that like spaces over tabs. Let's hear ya. No, 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 I want to hear ya. Yeah, spaces, all right. Tabs people, where are my tabs people at? All right, a little more boisterous. Photoshop? Let's hear it for Photoshop. All right. Sketch. Okay, all right. Uh, view? People in the house? Have people using View? Politely raise their hands. All right. Is it polite? How about React? Who's using React? Yeah. <laughs> This is good. And it, Jeremy talked about this earlier, right? There's, there's no wrong answer, right? This is, these are different tools that solve different problems, right? Or the same problem and sort of come at it from a different perspective. And what philosophy you and your team have is going to influence what, what tools you end up reaching for. But also, like what Jeremy was saying, a lot of these decisions end up having real impacts on the end user experiences we're creating, right? And so how we make these decisions uh, really does matter. And we don't make these decisions alone. How many people have ever worked on a project where uh, you, you end up using a certain CMS or a certain you know, library or a certain design tool because somebody on your team is like super jazzed up about using it? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah? Has that person ever been you? That <laughs> Be honest, right? But this is it. This stuff matters. So we have to figure out how to get alignment around this stuff. Because more cat gifts, because why not? Um, if we're all left to our own devices, right? You have maybe four developers on your team, and you all have these different opinions. You all have strong opinions on which tools to use and stuff. And we say, OK, everybody, let's go make a website, right? We end up with this sort of chaos. 
Uh, so okay, so we have to coordinate, we have to make some decisions. The other end of the spectrum is something a little different, right? A different cat gif, uh, which, is, which is this sort of stifling rigidity, right? Where we're only going to use these tools and you can't ever diverge uh, or else you're fired or whatever, right? So, so there's a spectrum here and we have to make a decision on where we sit on this spectrum. And this is gonna vary from team to team, right? You have to decide how much freedom do we want to have and how can we balance that with, with still sort of moving in the same direction, right? How can, we, how can we align with one another to sort of land on a place that, that allows each of the people uh, involved in the success of a project to be creative, to be expressive, uh, to solve problems in a way that, that is efficient for them, but to also work together to, to you know, a cohesive whole. So how do we get to this point where everyone on the team sort of knows their role in creating a, you know, a solid product, knows their role in, in, in making that happen, and knows what role everybody else plays in the equation? So I think a great way to make this sort of stuff happen is to establish principles and guidelines. And I've been sort of thinking about this stuff a lot over the last couple of years, but um, it really, presents itself as, as, as a hierarchy, right? We have this sort of company level at the sort of base of our pyramid. And I'll sort of start here, right? What, <laughs> this might be a company, right? So you have some marketing people, you have some sales people, you have some HR people, right? You have customer support, you have accounting, you have the, all these different departments. And if you were to just ask these people, okay, everybody, let's business. <laughs> Right? Everybody's going to sort of business the way that they were taught to business, right? It becomes a bit like the parable of the blind men and the elephant, right? Where all these blind men approach an elephant, they're asked to define what an elephant is, right? And the, the first blind man is, is up by the trunk and he touches it and he says, oh, an elephant is like a snake. And of course, the, the person by the, the, uh, the leg of the elephant says, oh, an elephant is like a tree, right? And of course, none of them have the full picture Right, so they're not able to you know, properly define what this thing is. So principles and guidelines, I think, serve as this sort of bird's eye perspective that help give people alignment on sort of, you know, here's how we business, right? And C. Todd mentioned earlier about sort of, you know, a mission statement and then product statements and stuff. And I think that, you know, there's going to be a lot of nice uh, overlap there because as it turns out, speaking last means that I get to repeat what everybody else said only more, much more articulately than, than me. So, hooray. Um, but yeah, so Charity Water is a nonprofit organization bringing clean and safe drinking water to people in developing nations. Boom. That's what we do. That means that the accounting people know that's what, you know, we're, we're all here to do. That's what we're showing up to do. The HR people, the design team, uh, everyone involved in the success of that company knows how to make that happen. But of course, that's just a sentence or a, you know, a paragraph. So taking that a step further, we, we establish company values. Uh, Zappos sort of famously has these 10 company values that they use to sort of influ or, you know, inform their company and everyone that works within it. Here's how you're expected to behave, right? Here's what we want from you, right? Create fun and a little weirdness, right? That's a cool company value that sort of helps set the stage for here's what's appropriate behavior, here's what behavior we're going to frown on, right? And again, this applies to literally everyone that works for the company. But really, you could sort of express a mission statement, establish values, right? But really, the, the lived experience, every single decision, every single interaction is, is what constitutes a company's culture. And it's important to establish some guidelines and principles around your company's culture because otherwise, again, everyone's going to be left to their own devices. Uh, there's a great book called The Culture Engine by Chris Edmonds, and he talks about establishing an organizational constitution, which is a bit like a design system at the company level, right? That establishes liberating rules. And I like that, that phrase, right? Liberating rules that free people up to sort of focus on bigger and better problems rather than saying, I don't know, do we do it this way or do we do it this way, right? That's wasted effort. So that's at the company level. Now let's get into a department. 
Most of us probably work in, you know, a communications department of sorts, maybe a marketing department or, or you know, whatever, whatever labels you use, but people that are communicating on behalf of, of a brand, right? And you might have a marketing department that contains public relations and digital people and maybe some social people and, you know, a CMO and a vice president and stuff like that, right? And again, okay, everybody, let's do marketing. Right? And we're going to go off and do marketing the way that you know, we've all sort of learned and, and interpret that as we see fit. So what principles and guidelines do is get everyone who's communicating on behalf of a brand, of a company, on the same page. And this takes the form of brand guidelines, right? So uh, Canonical, uh, who makes the Ubuntu uh, uh, operating system for, for Linux, they have a fantastic uh, brand assets, uh, brand style guide that defines, here's our logo. Here's how to use that logo. Here's how not to use that logo. Here's the spacing around that logo. Here's our color palette, and here's when to use it. Here's our neutral color palette. Here's tints and tones for this color palette. Right? Here's our font family, and here's how we're you know, expected to use it. Here's these pictograms, these little sort of brand elements that we use throughout the experience. Right? Here's these dot patterns that we might use on, you know, marketing materials that are in the print world, is it maybe a, a web page background or something like that, right? But really defining what these things are and how people should use them, right? And that helps create alignment, you know, irrespective of, of which end of the pool you're on, right? Whether you're a print person, a digital person, a native person, a web person, or whatever, you're all on the same page. Another really helpful tool is voice and tone guidelines, right? So MailChimp, which we've already heard about today uh, and, and yesterday, uh, you know, has this really cool cartoon chimpanzee, right? You know where this is going, right? Yeah, there we go. But so they established, they have this really sort of fun brand, sort of cheeky tone of voice, humorous, and that's great. Um, but their voice and tone guidelines created by Kate Kiefer Lee and a bunch of other smart people really help set the stage for how they need to talk to their users in a bunch of different contexts. So for a success message, right, this is what they have in their guidelines, right? So if somebody had just launched a marketing campaign or sent out an email blast or whatever, right, the person is feeling relief, pride, and joy, and they're thinking, whew, I finished this week's campaign, now I can finally enjoy the weekend, that's great, right? So MailChimp should respond with maybe the, the chimpanzee coming out going, yeah, fine piece of work, you deserve a raise, that's great, right? But let's say the user just spammed 300,000 people. Right? <laughs> or let's just say your credit card got declined. You don't want the little chimpanzee dancing out and going, ah, looks like the credit card was declined. Sorry about that. Right? <laughs> and this stuff matters. Like, especially, you know, the developers. We end up writing a lot of copy. Right? That's why you get all those hilarious error messages throughout, you know, every banking application you've ever used. Right? So this helps everyone communicating on behalf of, of the brand to, to all sort of speak the same language and present things in the right way. Then we get into teams, right? So now we're within the sort of digital walls of, of your organization and you have a bunch of different parts to your products or maybe multiple products or a bunch of different products, right? And you have different teams creating stuff for those different products. Okay, everybody, let's do good digital work, right? Again, we're moving off. We're going to go off and, and, and do things how we see fit. And what that leads to, of course, is, ah, but you don't understand, right? And we've all heard this. No, 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 like, you know, I'd love to sort of share this with you or this solution, but, you know, this particular use case is just so specific. And, you know, the other person's like, I, but I, I know brand colors are red, but like, I really, 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 really love purple, right? Like, so can't we just, right? And so with principles and guidelines, what we're able to do is align these disparate groups of, of, of people, all doing digital work, right, to, to move in the right direction. And this is the, the land of design systems, right? This is what design systems uh, uh, help assist with. So there's a bunch of bunch of different uh, definitions of what a design system in uh, what a design system is, and I like to 
to think of it as, as sort of the story of how your, your organization designs and builds products, right? And I like to sort of put it through the lens of a new hire, right? If you hire a new designer, if you hire a new developer, you say, you know, how, how, how are we going to do work here, right? Like, what, what should I be paying attention to? What should I be doing, right? How should I, you know, write this code? How should, you know, what, what sort of brand personality should, buy, should I be following, right? The design system is, is the answer to that, right? And so over the last couple of years, we've been seeing a ton of different uh, companies release their design systems into the world, which is fantastic. Uh, Salesforce's Lightning design system is fantastic. Uh, Google's material design is probably the most famous example of a design system. IBM's carbon design system, uh, one that we created for a giant organization uh, called the Unity design system, uh, basically helped sort of galvanize a lot of these principles and, and round them up under one roof. So we have design principles that sort of underpin uh, the entirety of the, of the system. We'll talk more about that in a bit. But it also had points of view on things like data entry, things like navigation. Here's how we think about color and in what sort of proportions, right? Here's why that matters, right? Here's our code conventions. Here's UI components, right? Here's all of our different form controls. And here's a specific component. And here's some guidelines around how to properly use that thing. So design system can include a bunch of stuff, right? There's a bunch of ingredients that make up collectively a design system. And which ingredients are included are going to vary based on the needs of, of your organization. Right? But it's at this point that we're able to sort of, you know, round up all of this institutional knowledge and sort of consolidate it and present it in one place. So now we get into an individual team. So now we take, without a design system, without any sort of, you know, sense of, of you know, direction, uh, all that great stuff that C. Todd was just talking about, right? You have different disciplines working on a project, right? You guess where this is going, right? This is, right? Let's all do things, right? And again, without like a product roadmap, without that sort of guidance, right? You're not going to, you're, you're going to get the situation. So principles and guidelines, once again, right? And this is sort of fostered through the design system, but also a clear product plan roadmap, like, like C. Todd was talking about earlier. And then lastly, we have uh, our, indiv uh, our individual disciplines. Right? So you might work with other designers, right? Or you might be a front end person and you work with other front end people. As it turns out, developers have opinions about things. Do you guys do you know this? Like this happens. So whenever we're <laughs> Sort of weird, I know. Like it's a sort of might come to news to, to some of you, but you know, whenever you're left to your own devices and you ask a bunch of a room full of front end developers, let's build a website. Again, same thing, right? So, how do we establish alignment? How do we get everybody on the same page? This takes the form of of code style guides, right? Things that in the front end world, at least. Right? Now that we have all of these different CSS methodologies and, and different approaches to you know, how to structure front-end code, we have to decide, is this how we do it? 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 <laughs> right? It G-zips quite nicely. Good for performance. Right? So we have to, to come together as disciplines and establish, hey, how are we actually going to do, do good work together, right? So if you're lucky, uh, you work at a place that, that has solid conventions in place, right? Has these points of view, has a perspective, and, and hopefully you should be able to draw a straight line through the middle of that pyramid, right? All of that stuff should be in alignment, as in, you know, the stuff, the visual design that, you, that your team is working on should align with the company's mission, right? And should align with uh, the brand guidelines and stuff like that. But design systems, I think, really focus on the people creating digital products at an organization or for organizations. And so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, there's a ton of different benefits of establishing a design system. Uh, the main one 
from a user perspective is that you get a more consistent, cohesive experience, right? So the first time you encounter a, a particular form field, right, you have to learn that, right? Um, uh, Claudio was just talking about this, right? Where you don't want to rock the boat too much, right? You don't want to sort of disrupt things and just burn everything down and replace it with other things. But because people take time, people use your products again and again, and as they use your products more, they get familiarized with them, right? So the first time they encounter a certain widget, say a date picker, right? By the time they get to the end of the flow and they're presented with another date picker for whatever reason, right? Right? They know how to respond to that, right? They're familiar with it. Ah, I've seen this before. And that allows them to get through that checkout flow faster, whatever it is they're trying to do, right? But the rest of these benefits really benefit you, right? The people in the room making this work happen, right? And the main thing is, is faster production, right? Rather than reinventing the card component for the umpteenth time, right, firing up an empty sketch document and, you know, <laughs> doing that again and again and again, you could focus your efforts on more worthwhile tasks, right, and launch more things in faster time. They establish a shared vocabulary so that designers and developers and project managers and everybody and the clients, they're all speaking the same language, right? So you get less of this. Oh yeah, we call that the top bar. Oh no, that's the that's the gray bar. Uh, no, we call that the utility bar. And you know, the front end people are like, oh, it's marked up as, you know, something else, right? Makes things easier to test. Uh, all that great stuff that Eduardo was just talking about, as far as performance goes, you're able to sort of isolate components, make those things fast as crap, right? And make them more flexible, more accessible. And then anywhere those patterns get deployed, boom, you get that stuff for free, which is great. It's a useful reference to keep coming back to, right? You reach for a data table. It's like, what, what should I be considering as I implement this data table, right? And then lastly, I think this is a really key component to this. These design systems really do serve as this future-friendly foundation for all work to come, right? As we've been hearing about so much over the last two days, right, this field is rapidly changing, right? There's more and more stuff coming on the horizon, more and more stuff that's entering our, our field of vision, right? What is our perspective on VR, right? All that great stuff Gabe was talking about earlier. It's like, you know, well, a design system is a place for that institutional knowledge. It's a place to, to articulate that point of view, right? So as new things come to be, right, chatbots, conversational UIs, anything that's coming, but also just evolutions in how we do good UI work and design trends and things like that, right? We're able to, once we have this foundation in place, we could iterate and evolve and grow things and you know, take all those things that we've learned from real product work and how people are using our real stuff and feed that back into the system. So that sounds great, yeah? Hope you're all jazzed up about design systems. I sure am. So how do we actually make them happen? Um, it's been so great to hear, to hear so many talks and people referencing uh, user research and, and actually talking to people as a good first step in sort of learning you know, what it is we should actually build. So uh, I love at the beginning of our design system projects talking to users. And what's strange is, yes, we talk to people who use the actual products themselves, but we also talk, the users of a design system are, are also designers, developers, right? The actual teams that are helping make digital work, right? A design system really does serve them. So these are some of the things that I've heard from uh, a client I was working with earlier this year, right? You could probably carbon date our UIs based on the design, right? You know, so it's just travel back through time. Uh, the main challenges are the existing thousands of lines of code acquisitions and existing suite of technologies that make up a billion dollars a year. We'd like to not lose that billion dollars. Fair point, right? We'll try not to <laughs> try to avoid that. Uh, there's a lot of institutional knowledge here locked up in people's heads, right? Slack channels are great, but it becomes a scavenger hunt to find information about how something's supposed to work. For a basic expand collapse pattern, the devs spent two days going to different teams to find the code and still had to rebuild it themselves. 
right? So this helps paint the picture of, of what the pain is, right? Uh, you know, all these product teams doing all this work, what is the pain and how might a design system actually help with that, right? So, so this is a crucial first step in just sort of getting a sense of what a design system at your company needs to do. So from there, uh, then we do our formal uh, kickoff workshop. And we used to use this opportunity as, uh, or use this day as an opportunity to sort of brainstorm and stuff like that. But what ended up happening is that the highest paid people in the room or the most extroverted people in the room end up sort of bulldozing these conversations and no you know, junior developer is going to you know, stand up to their CTO in the middle of one of these meetings. So what we now do is we sort of use that as an opportunity to sort of take that research and actually start presenting it uh, to them and start gathering broad consensus around this. And this, this might sound familiar because we've been hearing about this uh, from a few of the speakers uh, earlier today, which is great. Um, I have the good uh, fortune of working with Josh Clark on a lot of projects, so this is him sort of presenting what we've heard through our, our uh, you know, user interviews. And once we, we sort of bucket out the common themes and the common goals that, that could happen for a project, and we sort of paste them up on the wall, and we get the sticky notes out, because of course it's a design process, um, and we get them to vote. And what we end up with is a nice heat map of priorities for what this project needs to do, right? And I love uh, everything about Jeremy's talk, of course, but he talks about, uh, when he's talking about the, the HTML principles, where he talks about in cases of conflict, right? Ah, that's, that's it right there, because that's inevitable, right? All of these are valid goals for a project, right? You could, you could you know, slap them all up here. This one says that has no votes. It says, increase ad flexibility. That was from the ad guy, naturally, right? But even he didn't vote on it, right? So, so this is the thing, like everybody gets their individual, you know, sort of goals out of their system, but as a group, we're able to sort of come together and say, you know, there's limited time, there's limited budget, there's limited money, you know, how do we, how do we, you know, sort of align on, on what really matters, right? How do we make sure if this thing had to do three things really, really well, these are the three things. Right? Not to say that we're not going to address those other things, we're just going to, you know, in cases of conflict, this takes priority over this. And you could do the same for, uh, we've done exercises with different uh, features of a style guide, right? Where we sort of talk to different people and, and sort of brainstorm over, oh, cool, like we could add a, a theme switcher, or we could add sort of UX guidelines, or we could add uh, sort of framework specific code snippets. And so again, getting this heat map of, cool, what does a good style guide look like for this project? And that helps us prioritize how we're going to design and build this thing. So the priorities workshop really does help get this broad consensus. Uh, all the stakeholders involved in, this, in the success of the product is able to get together and go come out of the room at the end of the day and sort of feel pretty good. And at the end of the day, we, we regroup, we sort of reflect back, here's what we heard, and just sort of start establishing next steps. Um, I like showing this photo. This is our friends at, at about.com. Uh, some of the earlier photos uh, I was showing were, were these guys. And we did some work with them. And this, these were all the people involved in the kickoff. I love showing this picture because they don't even fit in one photo. Uh, this is not like three people off to the side going off and, and doing things unilaterally, right? This is their QA engineers, this is junior designers, this is senior designers, this is VPs, this is everybody, right? Because a design system needs to be born of the actual organization. So we, we regroup. We establish next steps, we have a pizza party, it's all very wonderful and lovely. And then we get to work. And one of the first things we do uh, to sort of translate a lot of the stuff we learned uh, away from just sort of sticky notes is to establish a set of design principles, right? And we've heard a bit about design principles already throughout the conference, but design principles really are the guiding light for a software application or for a design system or for an organization, right? They articulate the fundamental goals that all decisions can be measured against, thereby kept the pieces of the project moving towards an integrated whole, right? So what we found is establishing design principles is one, hard work, and two, uh, sort of constitutes a couple different parts. Uh, process 
And, and then the product itself will end up, the design system itself will encapsulate within it uh, its own set of design principles. So for a design system that we worked on uh, last year, these were some of the, the principles that we were following as the creators of the system uh, in order to make sure that we're meeting the goals, right? So make the best thing the easiest thing. Design for grab it quick efficiency. Uh, this was an organization with 500 developers and two designers. So that was fun. Um, and these developers were, were paired with like a business person. The business person would sort of bark, here's what we need to build. And the developer says, okay, okay, okay. So like UI design and like all that stuff was about as far from their minds as, as possible. So we had to, we had to, to fit the workflow, right? We had to fit that, that culture in order for the design system be, to be successful, right? We could write all this sort of thoughtful stuff and write paragraphs of text about, about certain things and perspectives, but if the developer doesn't have time to read any of that, it's all for, all for naught. And then the product itself ultimately ended up uh, baked within it, this set of design principles. So just enough interface, strong and direct. This was a big enterprise, so it's like strong and direct equals, you know, no rounded corners, right? Equals, you know, sort of a, a straightforward primary color palette, right? It's not, you know, not a lot of uh, the great design work we've been seeing from, from people like Claudio and Henri. Uh, it's like the opposite of that, right? And that's fine because, again, you know, the, that fits the, the goals of, of the system. So, we see these design principles baked into lots of different products, right? Lots of the operating systems of the world, iOS, uh, Windows, material design, have these principles baked in. And those design principles underpin and influence every single design, development, business decision that gets made, right? Like I said earlier, though, uh, these things are crazy hard to create. Um, having lived through this process like a bunch of times, it's really, really, really challenging. Uh, this post by Jared Spool is really fantastic. Um, he talks about some questions you want to ask yourself when creating design principles, right? Does it come from research, right? Is this actually born of reality, or is, are these just sort of truisms, right? Does it help you say no most of the time? That's pretty interesting, right? So take a, a principle like strong and direct, right? That helps you answer those questions of, you know, oh, look at this like cool, really rounded, really beveled, or really sort of drop shadowed, fuzzy sort of thing. It's like, yeah, that doesn't really mean strong and direct, right? Does it distinguish your design from your competitors? Is it something you might reverse in a future release? And that's a sort of a cool one, right? Because a design principle is a point of view, right? It is, it is taking a stand, right? Again, it's not a truism. It's not make it, make it clean and simple. Right? It's like, would you ever reverse? Is the opposite of that true? It's like, let's make this really hard and complicated and cumbersome and complex. Like, you could, it's really hard to imagine too many scenarios where that's true, right? Have you evaluated it for this project? And then also, is this meaning constantly tested, right? These are living, right? They're meant to adapt and change like the rest of the system. So, design principles, good idea. Good idea to get off the ground at the beginning of the project, but it's never too late to establish them. So, we have a set of design principles. Time to make stuff, right? We still have to figure a lot of things out. We have to figure out how we're going to work with each other. And this sort of takes the form of both sort of an intradisciplinary and interdisciplinary uh, sort of angle. Um, so from a design standpoint, right, we've been seeing a lot of tools start to get the hint of, oh yeah, designers actually work with each other and they need to share things back and forth. Maybe we should do some stuff that makes that easier for them. So this is great. I'm, I'm absolutely loving a lot of the things that have been coming out lately. Uh, anybody use Creative Cloud libraries in here? Okay. How do you like it? Yeah? Good, solid thumbs up, that's good news, right? How about Figma, anybody playing around with Figma? Figma is like Google Docs, but for design, it's like a web-based 
uh, design tool, and so you have multiple de designers working in the same thing. So you don't have to worry about sort of, you know, syncing between documents and stuff like that. You're all in the same place. You're all working on the same thing, which is pretty neat. Uh, anybody using Envision, and specifically Craft by Envision? Yeah? How do you like that? Good news? Okay, cool. Lots of hands going up. So this helps you know, sync these, these design assets between documents, between, uh, you know, and it actually sort of creates a little style guide for you, which is cool. There's another tool that I'll talk about a little bit uh, called Brand AI. Uh, I'm going to show it here. Same sort of thing, right? You have this palette, you're able to save components, those components sort of get synced sort of to the, to the cloud, and then, you know, the other people sort of get those changes automatically, and there's a workflow in there for if things update, right? And then just this week, this, this, within the last week, Sketch announced that uh, they, they launched their own uh, version of libraries, which means that you can now sort of establish these components, save them in sort of a, a shared library, and then, you know, across different do uh, documents and across uh, working with different uh, designers on the team, you can now sort of make use of each other's stuff. And if something changes in one place, it will be reflected elsewhere. Good stuff, right? So, so definitely, if you're not working in this way, highly recommend you, you doing it. If you're doing it a little bit, um, you know, tools like Sketch have, have symbols, but then they also have nested symbols. Use that. Use the dynamic properties of these design tools that helps make these components more flexible, scalable, all that good stuff. Um, and then just outside of the tools themselves, uh, there's a great resource uh, by a guy named Dan Rose called Photoshop Etiquette. But even if you're not using Photoshop, I definitely recommend you checking this out. Uh, it, what it is is it's just essentially a style guide for how you designers work together, right? So rather than layer two, copy two, copy three, copy seven, copy whatever, and like nested in a bunch of bullshit you know, folders and stuff, uh, this sort of helps lay out like syntactically and, and you know, here's what we name our files, here's how our file structure should look and stuff. These are great conversations to have with the design team so it doesn't turn into this rat's nest that has been like literally every design project I've ever worked on. So, so do that. From a front-end perspective, I sort of created something similar called the front-end guidelines questionnaire. I do a lot of work with front-end teams, and I go in and we basically take a morning and we just have some conversations about what we collectively care about. And so some of the questions are, you know, what are some general principles the team should follow when writing HTML? What does it mean to write HTML at your company? Right? Does that mean accessible tags? Does that mean you know, proper ARIA attributes? Is that using, you, you get the idea. Spaces or tabs? Yes, we go there. Right? And once the tears dry up and, and the blood is wiped off the floor, uh, we end up with some, some decisions on, OK, tabs one, and you know, I'll reluctantly sort of go along with this. Right? Do we use SMACS, BEM, or some other methodology? Why? How? Right? What's our SVG strategy? All that, that knowledge bomb that Sarah dropped on you. It's just like, pff, like fire hose of like great stuff. And then it's like, all right, like how, how are we going to do this? Right? That was a great conversation with, with your team once you get back to the office. Right? How are we handling layout? That knowledge bomb that Rachel dropped on us, right? It's like, oh crap, here's all this crazy stuff. Like, hey, we need to have a point of view, a perspective on this. And the great thing is, is that even if you're not like biting on CSS grid right now or whatever, by establishing conventions and talking about your rationale for, oh, here's why we're doing it this way, or oh, here's how you know big of a level of effort it would take, just by having those conventions allows you to sort of over time, iterate and sort of systematically work through these things. Oh, hey, grid's better updated now, or oh, great, we just dropped IE11 support, which means that we can now do this. So you're able to sort of have better conversations, more fruitful conversations. What are we doing about performance, right? All the great stuff that, uh, that Eduardo was just talking about, right? Like how are we, what tactics are we putting in place? What tools, right, uh, are, we, are we putting in place to make this a priority? Right? What tools are we using to compile our CSS and serve up our CSS? What JavaScript tools and libraries are we making use of? Right? 
So that's all stuff that helps people get on the same page. The cool thing is, is that at the end of this exercise, I do uh, this with, with all these front-end teams, we establish code conventions, right? So, okay, we're going with BEM, and we're, you know, here's what commenting looks like, and here's what stuff. Then we all fire up a code pen at the end of it, and I just say, you know, here's a card pattern. I just draw a picture, code it. And then we basically spend five, 10 minutes coding that up, and then we go around the room and sort of compare notes. Because uh, it's funny, you can talk about this stuff a lot. Everybody could go, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And then you look at the actual code, you're like, oof. Right? So this is a great opportunity to sort of get everybody on the same page and go, ah, OK, I get what we actually mean. Another thing before we ever sort of get started on our projects is, is understanding uh, you know, which environment we're going to be sort of creating in. And from a front end perspective, I think this is really important. Um, sort of building within the final environment itself, I found to be really cumbersome. Building UI code, especially, really cumbersome. Um, so I think it's important to sort of understand how you and your team are going to work most efficiently together. So my wife is a jeweler and a metalsmith, and this is her studio. And this is the environment that she designed for her to be creative, for her to break things, for her to solder things, for her to make a mess, for her to hammer and you know, polish and buff and do all that stuff so that she's able to create her work, right? This is a very important environment for her. It's not the cleanest thing in the world, and that's okay, because this is you know, what that environment is made for. But that's a different environment than the storefront where she presents her final work, right? So she presents her work on her website, uh, on her Etsy page, and where she's able to sort of create and, and display a lot of other information, like here's the process, here's the materials that were used about this, here's you know, what all went into this, here's a bit more about me, right? All of that information is, is designed for a different audience, right? This is a much different environment than the environment she's using to sort of make stuff, right? Her live shows don't have a bunch of sort of metal dust on the ground, right? It's, it's meant to be a storefront. So what that means in terms of design systems, there's a bunch of different tools out there to create style guides, to create stuff. There's React Playground, there's Fractal, there's Pattern Lab, there's all this stuff. And, and it's confusing. It is very confusing. But I think we need to sort of differentiate sort of the workshop and the storefront. We need an environment that allows us to sort of build and design UI in an effective way. Um, so I work on a tool called Pattern Lab, and I use Pattern Lab as my workshop. Other people use other tools for this. But what Pattern Lab allows us to do is define, you know, write the markup for our data tables and sort of, OK, here's what they look like. Here's where I'm writing my CSS. Here's where I'm writing my markup. And we're able to sort of put that into the context of a page very effectively. We're able to sort of swap out the, uh, the, the content to make sure that the data table is able to handle real content, right? We're able to sort of test what happens if that data table doesn't go the full browser width. We're able to test what happens whenever you pour real gnarly content into it, right? Uh, designers love, especially the designers I worked with in the early days, loved everyone's, every user's name was Sarah Smith without an H on the end, right? It was like, oh, how convenient. That just fits so nicely in that little spot there. But of course, that never happens, right? So we need to make sure that our patterns are resilient, right? The components we create are resilient and are able to handle you know, the most gnarly content, the most simple content, and everything in between. What happens on small screens, right? How do we sort of you know, work with responsive design? So this, this environment allows us to create these patterns and stress test them. And then once those things are done, once those are complete, right? just how we take something from a warehouse and put it in the storefront window, right? this process of going, OK, here's our data table pattern. Here it is, and put it on display in the style guide. And at this level, we're able to sort of see a real working example of that finished data table. We're able to sort of give it a, a description, a title, uh, show the different variations of it. So here's the variation that sort of condenses the data table so you can sort of get rid of some of the padding to sort of cinch it up a bit, you know, zebra stripes and so on and so forth, 
right? Here's the code for that thing. Here's the usage for this. So here's some of the considerations we need to keep in mind uh, with respect to responsive design and data density and things like that. And then here's all the, the code that makes it up. Here's the anatomy of this pattern. Here's what's required. Here's what's optional. This is like hard freaking work. But at the same time, this is really important, right? This helps the people who are ultimately going to be the users of the design system reach for this pattern and go, ah, I know, I know exactly how to use this thing, right? Uh, if you're interested in this, uh, I created a tool called Style Guide Guide, which is sort of an abstraction of the, of the client project I was just showing you. Uh, and basically, it's just like a boilerplate. It's just a Jekyll site that, that sort of stubs out like the basic IA of a style guide. But it's up to you to sort of fill in the blanks. So it's like you'll see a design principles page, and it's just blank. Right? You got to do that work yourself, sorry. But at the same time, like, hopefully that sort of helps kickstart things. OK. So that's the sort of intradisciplinary. How are front end developers going to work together? How are designers going to work together? But now we get into the thornier issue, right? Interdisciplinary uh, collaboration, right? This is a, a standard uh, design handoff. Um, you know, so we like to do these things where we create these 200 page. Uh, PDF wireframes, go through a couple rounds of review for that. Wireframes get handed off to the visual designer. Visual designer goes to the client, says, hey, here's what we came up with for the home page. What do you think? Right? Client goes, oh, yeah, that looks freaking amazing. Can we just move this here and this here? We're like, yeah, yeah, that's no problem. And then they go away and they do a V2 of that. And they say, yeah, is this what you had in mind? They're like, yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. Uh, can we also do a little bit of this and that? And they're like, yeah, sure, that's no problem. And then they go away and then they do a V3 and they come back and they say, here you go. We did that. We made those changes. The client says, yeah, that's, that's exactly what we need. But can we bring back a little of that V1 back into it? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah cool. And then eventually, right, homepage underscore V14 underscore final underscore for dev review underscore final final underscore V2 underscore Brad edits dot PSD or whatever gets approved, right? <laughs> And then they throw it at the, the coders. And it's like, hey, dev team, you've got negative three weeks to build this. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, the question for the designers in the room, have you ever been ashamed to add a live link to a website you've worked on in your portfolio? Right? They're like, no, 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 you want to look at, at this version. <laughs> you want to look at this JPEG of this. Not the piece of shit that's live on the site, right? <laughs> I pay no attention to that, right? This is a problem. This is a big problem, right? So, so we have to find better ways of, of preventing this from happening because, you know, rather than burning all of our efforts sort of creating pictures of websites, let's spend time actually creating websites together. And that's hard to do, right? And that means sort of getting away from this sort of old thing of like having to go in and sort of eye drop stuff. And, and a lot of this stuff gets lost in translation. So there's a lot of different things we could do to uh, sort of help bridge this divide and get people on the same page. Uh, one of the cool sort of solutions um, not total solutions, but I think a tool that's really helpful is this concept of, of design tokens. What design tokens are, and it was popularized by the Salesforce team in their lightning design system, is sort of taking all of your different products and recognizing you, know, you might have your marketing site, you might have your actual product, you might have an internet, you might have emails, you might have presentation materials, you have all sorts of different stuff lying around your organization, right? And that's frustrating, right? And if you're Starbucks or whatever, you have to make sure that Starbucks green is sort of translating properly to all these different environments. So that's what design tokens are. It's sort of, it's like a variable, uh, only you're sort of taking it out of any one specific implementation, right? It's just agnostic variables, right? It's not a SAS variable, it's not an iOS variable, it's not, you know, a, a color chiclet in Sketch or anything like that. It's just the color Starbucks green. Right? So there's a bunch of different things, design attributes, 
sort of like subatomic elements or whatever that you can elevate to the level of, of a design token. So things like border radius, things like colors, things like uh, fonts and, and things like that. Uh, there's a bunch of tools out there. Salesforce released one called Theo, uh, which is a tool that sort of converts these design tokens into technology-specific implementations. Uh, there's another tool that I mentioned earlier uh, with design tools is this uh, tool called Brand AI. And what Brand AI does is sort of provides a GUI for, for making and managing this stuff. So you have uh, a color palette. Here's our brand colors. Here's our neutral colors. Here's our font family, here's our icons, here's our little sort of spacing constants and border radius values, things like that. And then from there, it sort of integrates with all these different tools uh, like Sketch, like Photoshop, uh, even freaking PowerPoint and stuff like that, which is pretty neat. But it also exports as CSS, just raw CSS or SCSS or JSON or whatever. So wherever you're, you're defining your color stuff, you can sort of suck that into your project. And what you end up with is this sort of pretty cool workflow here. So I'll just show this to you. So here's my primary heading that we've described. And I have that in Sketch. And if I go over, I have a nice little panel that reflects what's in Brand AI. And then I have the thing working in the browser inside of Pattern Lab. And then uh, as the art director, I say, you know what? This needs to be bigger, and it needs to be Brand Brown. So I come into Sketch. That updated pretty immediately. And then I sort of rip this down, rip these changes down in my, in my dev workflow. Um, and again, you could probably streamline it more than I have, and then sort of rebuild the thing. And then if I go into my dev environment, you go, boom, right? There's my updated header. So I think that that's pretty cool. And, and even if you're not using it for, for this sort of sophisticated stuff, at least like a color palette, right? Just making, like I want to, as a front end developer, I just want somebody to go, to just own color, right? Like I would rather not touch another sort of hex value. I'd rather offload that to the designer. And this is, I think, a, sort of a cool tactic for sort of making that happen. And I think that what's nice about this is this sort of gets away from a lot of the stuff uh, the, the tools of the past. Rachel mentioned Dreamweaver as this sort of all-in-one tool, right? It's like, oh, we're creating like the visual design, but also the code for it. And we still see this stuff. I still see all these articles on medium.com and stuff that's like, publish websites directly from Sketch. No coding needed, right? Translating a visual design to CSS and HTML is now a mundane task of the past. The responsibility for all things UI is back in the hands of the designers. No more dealing with those asshole developers, ah, <laughs> right? So, but <laughs> there really is no substitute for actually collaborating and working together to build something real. Uh, one of the things I get frustrated by is, is devs starting work late on a project. And I think that there's a lot of work that can be done right at the beginning of a project, right? So uh, for a client project we were working on, uh, we, we knew we were going to have a header <laughs> and a footer, uh, and we knew there was going to be hero unit, so here's my hero unit. I made this in the first hour of the first day of the project. That's what it looked like. Looks like crap. That's fine, because we're going to work with the design team who started playing around with this sort of illustration style and sort of stuff like that, working in tools like Sketch and Figma to sort of create this stuff. And then we'd bring that into the browser, and then they'd sort of massage things and play with it. But then ultimately, they sort of phased out their stuff, and we are able to sort of get into the browser and stay in the browser and do our iteration there. Right? So this iterative process allows us to sort of design and build in tight iterative loops and spend less time on those like V14s of comps and instead spend that, that time, that effort, that blood, sweat, and tears in the environment that matters, right? Which is the browser. And when you're in the browser, you could test for things like performance. You could show interactivity. You could show animation. You could show true type rendering, true color rendering, like all these things that are just impossible to do in a static environment. And I think what freaks a lot of designers out is <laughs> when, once you have a design system, once you have these patterns sort of codified and presented in a, in a style guide, 
You no longer have to do that new sketch artboard. You no longer have to just like create uh, you know, a blank document, recreate that card component again, and, and sort of pitch, pixel nudge everything around. Right? You can literally draw up a, a whiteboard sketch and then slap it together in some includes in the code base and go, you mean like this? Right? Literally in the time it takes you to sort of you know, get the words out of your mouth, the developer or even, hell, the designers can learn how to just copy and paste includes. Right, and just sort of put some stuff together, swap out some data, and say, here's the new feature, right? When do we launch? Right, so this is, this is cool, but I think it really sort of short circuits the processes that we've been used to. And what I found is, is you know, whenever I get pushback working with different teams, I, I really have to articulate that, you know, it's not that design is dead. It's not that UX design doesn't matter. It's just that I, I want, your thinking. I want the designer's thinking baked into the final product rather than some 200 page PDF that's going to get thrown in the trash can. Right? That's what I want, right? I want hovering art directors. I want you to literally sit beside me and we'll work in Web Inspector and sort of massage things into place. So, all that's to say, there really is no tool substitute for, for genuine human collaboration and communication. So, I hope you find <laughs> your place on this spectrum, right? I hope you're able to sort of work with your team and find out how much, you know, flexibility or rigidity you need in order to do good work together. And I hope you're able to draw a straight line. Again, like all of these things are in alignment, right? That your company goals and the way you code or the, the design tools you use are in a straight line. And I think it's so important for, for us to sort of get on the same page, to get aligned and move in the right direction, to move together in the right direction, to have everyone understand why we're moving in the right direction. And not to get like totally out there, but you know, this, these concepts, right? Getting alignment, bringing a bunch of disparate people together, and, and getting on the same page is tough work, right? And the world is crazy right now. I think that we need this kind of thinking more than ever, right? This goes beyond just our, our design and, and development worlds, right? This, is, this affects every aspect of, of how we live our lives, what society looks like, right? How do we come together and establish these shared principles and guidelines? Even if we don't agree on the, the exact tactics, let's at least just take a step back and get on the same page and, and you know, figure out how best to move forward, right? Uh, I love C. Todd's talk because he says, okay, everybody make everybody happy. Maybe that's a good design principle for the world, right? Like, how about let's be healthy, right? You could at least agree people should probably be healthy and happy, right? Those, that seems pretty fair, right? I'd like to, if you don't believe that, please come up and talk to me and I'll take care of you uh, later, but, like, <laughs> but this is important, right? Once we're on the same page with these principles, then we can start getting tactical, then we can start getting into the weeds, but always, always, always have these design principles in mind, right? And I love what Jeremy said. I think it's, it's so incredibly important to, to realize that we are in the driver's seat, right? None of this is determined for us, right? All of these things, right, from SAS variables to, you know, product roadmaps to performance to whatever, these are all human inventions, right? We have the ability to, to guide those human inventions. We have the ability to make new inventions. And so I hope that you take what you've learned the last couple days and make that happen. Do great things. So thank you.